Well, good morning. Uh, I'm sorry not to be able to be with you in person in Stockholm. Uh, my subject uh, that I'm going to talk about today is money and the credit cycle. And when I, you actually see uh, this uh, lecture, uh, I will be in China uh, looking at issues to do with credit and uh, money creation uh, and the dangers that uh, credit expansion in China is heading towards uh, a crisis. So I will be in an appropriate place, but it would also be very appropriate for me uh, to be talking about this in Stockholm, in Sweden, because I think the Swedish School of Economics uh, in particular, and in uh, very particularly uh, Knut Vixell, had some insights into the nature of credit creation and what that does within an economy and the challenges that come from that, which were subsequently developed and explored by early and mid 20th century uh, economists such as Hayek and Fisher, but which I will argue have been to a significant extent ignored or assumed as unimportant uh, by much of modern uh, macroeconomics. So in part, uh, what I'm going to talk about this morning is a piece of intellectual uh, history, uh, but with a very clear conclusion. And the conclusion is that the credit cycle and the level of leverage in an economy, that these are crucial economic variables which we need to pay attention to and did not pay adequate attention to before the crisis and that in order to pay attention to them and deal with them effectively we need to go well beyond the current new conventional wisdom that we need to add financial stability as a parallel but separate uh, focus to monetary uh, stability. I will assert instead that we need a whole new mindset and an integrated approach integrating across monetary policy and financial stability issues in order to uh, control and constrain the credit cycle. So that is the theme that I'm going to set forward. Can I just say a, a quick word on the uh, technology of how we're going to uh, do this, which I hope is going to work. Uh, behind me uh, on the screen, uh, you will see that there are some uh, slides, which, however, you, you can't uh, see because I am in the way of them. But I hope that you have been provided either on a separate screen uh, or with a physical printed copy of uh, the slides, uh, which I hope will uh, help make the communication uh, work a bit. But in order to make sure that you can see where we are in the process, as I change the slides, I will mention the number of the slide uh, that we are on. Let me begin with Knut Vixell's fundamental uh, insight, which was based upon uh, the analysis of the way that credit extension uh, creates purchasing power. Uh, Vixell was already operating in an environment where most payments were no longer notes and coins. They were credit-based. And he asked the question, what are the consequences of payments being based on the basis of credit rather than notes and coins? And he began by pointing out that even if you had what, you call, what he called a simple credit economy, in which credit was simply extended on a bilateral basis uh, between uh, businesses, that that in itself would create additional purchasing power above and beyond that uh, which uh, exists on the basis of pure metallic money. But then he said if you go beyond that and have what you call a system of organized credit, by which he meant a system with commercial uh, banks and with deposit money as the fundamental form of payments, he asserted that that clearly created purchasing power and created it ex nihilo, out of nothing, uh, that new purchasing power uh, was created. I think, and if we look at the first slide, that this is a fundamental insight. We sometimes say that what banks do is they take deposits from households and they then lend it to entrepreneurs or businesses. I think that is a bad description of what banks do. I think we need to fundamentally understand, as Vixel asserted, that what banks do is they create both a loan he assumed it was a loan to an entrepreneur, and the money in that entrepreneur's account. That creates purchasing power. 
The fact that it creates purchasing power crucially depends upon maturity transformation, on the fact that the loan is of longer tenor uh, than uh, the deposit. But that insight is, I think, fundamental and I think too much lost in first certainly our undergraduate economics textbooks, but even, I think, in more advanced economics. Vixel then asked the question, okay, well, if credit, and in particular bank organized credit, creates purchasing power, what constrains that purchasing power creation? Or do we have a problem that it can simply go on growing uh, limitlessly and therefore create uh, inflation? And so you ask the question, and we turn now to my second slide, what is it that limits bank credit creation? And what is it that freely limits it before we introduce the idea of a authority attempting to constrain it? His assumption was that banks would freely choose to hold reserves, cash reserves or reserves at uh, the central bank, and that the fact of those reserves, the need to hold those reserves in some proportion to the size of their balance sheet, uh, constrained credit and money creation. But then he noted three ways in which the degree of those constraints uh, would change uh, over time. First of all, he said, the more payments go through a gyro system rather than a cash system, the more at the level of the total banking system you don't really need uh, reserves because you don't have to deal with the fact that people will suddenly decide to uh, take a physical cash, paper cash or, or coin cash out of the banking system. Secondly, and I think this was a really crucial insight, he asked the question, what if the banking system was organised as one bank rather than many competing banks? Uh, in that environment, you could be certain that when the entrepreneur who had received the loan, spent uh, the money from that loan, although it would leave his account, it would be bound to be end up uh, in an account of somebody else at that bank. And he said, well, the more that the banking system is, in, is a, organized as one bank rather than many banks, the less freely constrained uh, it will be. Thirdly, he noted the fact that at least as his time, uh, international payments were not entirely done on a credit basis. There still was movement of uh, precious metal uh, gold uh, bullion, or at least claims to credit metal, to precious metal gold bullion. And he said that the fact that there was still uh, a metallic money anchor would somewhat more constrain credit creation than you would have if an economy was entirely closed, or indeed if the entire world economy also fundamentally made payments on a credit basis. Now, those three insights, I think, are very important to what then happened over uh, the subsequent hundred years. And I'm going to argue later uh, that those three constraints, uh, they change over the hundred years and they make the credit cycle less and less constrained. And I'll come back to that later. But Vixel's fundamental insight, if I return to it on the next slide, slide three, uh, is that banks create credit and uh, purchasing power. And the way he believed that this was constrained uh, beyond the constraint that would be freely arising from banks' behaviour would be if a central bank made sure that the money uh, rate of interest, which was influenced by the central bank, was equal to the natural rate of interest, where the fundamental concept of the natural rate of interest is pretty much equivalent to the, the MPC, as I call it there, uh, the marginal productivity of capital. I think Vixel's insight into the nature of credit creation was fundamental. I think in two ways, Vixel's insights are still uh, limited. One, he assumes that all credit is extended to entrepreneurs to make real new physical investment. And that turns out not to be true, and I'll come back to that. And also, he assumes that the fundamental problem that we're dealing with here is whether too much credit creation creates inflation. It's a price stability issue. And I think that is a, a limiting assumption. It is the limiting assumption uh, which most modern macroeconomics and pre-crisis central bank orthodoxy has also accepted, that the fundamental issue is price stability. A subsequent series of economists, and I'm going to talk about Hayek, Fisher, Minsky uh, and Simons, I think correctly identified that credit creation had a set of other implications that go beyond uh, price stability 
and it's those that I would like to uh, explore by then think before then thinking about how modern economics has dealt with it. But before turning to those points, I think it's useful to step back and consider the role of credit relative to other options to create adequate demand. Because if Vixel is right that credit uh, creates purchasing power, I think it is useful, and if we now look at slide four, to think about credit creation as one of two alternative ways to make sure that nominal demand, aggregate nominal demand, is adequate uh, within an economy. Let's think about the problems, which of course people did think about at the time of Vixel, about a pure metallic money system, a system of uh, a gold standard. If it was truly pure metallic money and there was no either simple credit or organized bank credit, then clearly the money supply would be constrained by precious metal resources. And of course, many people in the late 19th century worried about the implication of that. And they said, here is the problem that if our money supply is constrained by uh, real precious metal resources, it may be that we can only achieve a adequate level of real growth if we have a downward flexibility of wages uh, and prices. And it may be that downward flexibility of wages and prices is in itself uh, disruptive uh, to a real growth or is unattainable. It is also the case that in an environment uh, of pure metallic money, you can, what the early economists described of, you can have savings actually taking the form of pure hoarding. If somebody saves in a pure metallic money environment and actually puts metal coin under the bed, it is truly removed from the economic circulation in a way which is not true of savings within an environment uh, which has a credit system and bank money. So there can be a set of problems to do with an inadequacy of aggregate nominal demand. Now, of course, if we believed that uh, the economy is so flexible in terms of real wages and prices that it will automatically get at a reasonable equilibrium uh, whatever the money supply, then this doesn't matter. But actually most modern uh, macroeconomics and most policy has converged to the belief uh, that the optimal uh, way to run the macroeconomy is to have a low and positive inflation rate uh, and therefore a, a rate of a nominal GDP growth, which is, let us say, for an advanced economy in the region of 4% or so, allowing for 2% real growth and maybe 2% inflation. If that that is the case, uh, if that is the optimal way to run a modern economy, you have an issue of where does that aggregate nominal demand come from. And I think it's useful to think about two alternative ways that it can come. First of all, it can come from pure fiat money creation. A state can create money and can stand, spend it. It can create, it can run an unfunded uh, fiscal uh, deficit. Uh, and it can cover it uh, with money. And I'll, as I'll say in a minute, there have been environments where that has been a successful way of stimulating economies. But we have tended to be very wary of that as a way forward for creating aggregate nominal demand, and credit creation is an alternative way of doing it. So one of the ways to think about private bank credit and money creation is it is a way of creating aggregate nominal demand growth in a way which is an alternative to pure fiat money uh, demand growth. And if you look at some 19th century commentators, such as Walter Badgett, they were convinced that the development of the banking systems in countries like uh, England had enabled an expansion of aggregate nominal demand, which was not possible in a country like France, where Badgett said the trouble is that extra saving can take the form of pure hoarding. So I'd like to suggest that it's useful to think about pure fiat money creation and private uh, money creation, private bank money creation, as two alternative ways as overcoming the problems created uh, by uh, limits of metallic money.